Hello and welcome to SciShow Talk Show. It's that day on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today we're talking to Toby Sprabilla, who I'm guessing from the contents of my table studies lichen. Is that right? That's right. That's what I do. And do you study lichen in any particular place? Sis? Well, I started studying lichen in, in lichens in northwestern Montana. Is, it, uh, should I, to, is the plural of lichen lichens? The plural of lichen is lichens, yeah. So I already messed up. Well, there's kind of this, well, you almost had me too, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's kind of this debate. Is it a countable noun or is it not a countable noun? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there's more than one lichen on the table. Exactly. Is this lichen or, like, or are these lichens? Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll just say they're lichens. And you have studied lichens in many places. Yeah. So I, I kind of got my start close to 20 years ago in northwest Montana, not terribly far from here, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and since then, I've lichens have gotten me a lot of places. Oh. Yeah. I like to so, think that, that uh, I could actually put a bumper sticker on the back of my car that said, I am supported by lichen dollars. Well, I don't think that you can't do that. That is a th like, it is your car. Yeah, exactly. And you could just go on Cafe Press, and maybe somebody else would even buy it. Exactly. You could just be the lichen salesman of the internet. Now, now, tell me, explain to me what a lichen is. So a lichen is really unlike, there's going to be a lot of puns, or, or half puns here. <laughs> um, a lichen is unlike a lot of other things that you see in nature that are of similar size and shape. Mm -hmm. So plants are multicellular organisms. When you yank a plant out, the whole plant dies. Um, Mosses, which I brought a couple examples of here, are basically tiny plants. If you look very closely with a hand lens, you'll see that uh, they're actually, there's little stems and leaves and so on, and they're, they're individuals. They're basically small versions of plants that don't have quite the, the same architecture to mm -hmm. transport water and whatnot. Lichens, by contrast, are microbial communities. They're, they consist of lots and lots of little microbes which self-assemble mm -hmm. in a self-replicating fashion. So uh, this little bits of this uh, can break off and start a new lichen. You can uh, kill parts of this lichen without killing other parts of the lichen. So it's very, very different than a lot of, than like plants or animals that are single multicellular mm -hmm. uh, organisms that right. die in one fell swoop when they die. But there are other kinds of microbial communities out mm -hmm. there. There's you know, bacterial plaques, there's, I don't know, like sponges are kind of weird in that way in, in which we sort of refer to them as animals, but they also sort of self-assemble and you can blend them up and then they reassemble in, in a way. Exactly. Um, and so there, there, there are these weird places where our definitions start to break down a little bit. And I feel like we talk about like, and this is a, uh, but there's so much diversity inside of lichens that maybe we're not Sure. We're not always entirely sure what we're talking about. I am not always entirely sure what I'm talking about. So, so maybe this would be a good juncture to introduce the word symbiosis. Okay, yes. All right. So uh, what is particularly interesting about this self-assembling microbial community is that it is a symbiosis. Mm -hmm. And on the inside of each and every one of these lichens are millions of tiny green photosynthesizing cells that are uh, algal cells. Mm -hmm. uh, they constitute algae in the plural, and they are doing their photosynthetic thing and bringing, creating sugars and mm -hmm. providing that to the outer structure. And most of what you see on the outside when you're looking at a lichen is fungal. And this is in some sort of steady state or equilibrium that they are providing nutrients to the fungus and the fungus is providing a house for them to live in safe from predation on the outside. Mm -hmm. And this and happens and in a predictable well. fashion. Exactly, and structure. So like, it, this is almost like, when, when, so, I feel like there's too much to talk about here, but when did lichens happen? When did lichens happen? In the uh, early fog of uh, terrestrial life. Okay. Uh, so. Because I feel like algae is sort of like, you think of algae, it's got to live in the water, but, uh, but lichens are a way for algae to live on land. Yeah. I kind of think of it that way. Yes. Does that make sense? That does make considerable sense. Okay. Um, so, we don't know nearly as much about the early, uh, forms of lichen life as we do about things that have preservable bones and other structures that were preserved as fossils because lichens don't preserve as fossils well at all. Mm. Basically, most of what we know about 
very, very, very old lichens are lichens that were preserved in amber. So they were kind of, mm. they had sap mm -hmm. flowing over them so and then you they were preserved trees, in situ, exactly. Like before you can see lichens. Yeah, and you can imagine how many different lichens were not preserved in amber because right. they just weren't growing in the right places. Right. So we don't know a whole lot and what we know about the early dawns of lichen life um, uh, is derived from DNA sequences. What you're right. able to reconstruct just from DNA sequences and saying at a mutation rate of such and such and a population size of such and so such. So there's a lot of divergence exactly. between different lichens and you can sort of trace back yeah. to their common ancestor. I've actually brought examples of three different groups of lichens that are as distantly related to each other based on the fungal partner, which is what we use for making estimations of that sort, mm -hmm. as are mammals from amphibians and from lungfish, basically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so like back from the dawn of exactly of terrestrial vertebrates, and those are these three here. These are as distantly related to each other as some of the main groups of vertebrates. Mm. So, so lichens and vertebrates happened around the same time. You think? We well, think uh, terrestrial vertebrates, right? Ter terrestrial vertebrates, uh, more or less coincide with a considerable error bar. Okay. Um, with uh, with the uh, the earliest fungal groups that split off and made lichens that we know about. So to me, no offense, lichens, uh, they look pretty similar, mm -hmm. uh, but they are very, very different. Uh, is there a way as a trained person that you can see that, see that difference and show it to me? Um, not at this level, but at a microscopic level, right. when you start breaking things down, you can see the types of symbioses that they enter. It's actually not just one alga. There's lots of different algae that mm -hmm. have engaged in different symbioses with different fungal strains. Mm -hmm. They're wildly different fungal strains that at a microscopic level look different, but there's some macroscopic things that you can see right offhand, which is why I brought a couple of these examples with. And is, uh, would you, do all lichens sort of derive from a common lichen ancestor, or is this a thing that happened multiple times across Earth? Uh, this is something that happened multiple times across Earth. Okay. That's pretty clear, yeah. That's interesting. So when did fungi start being a thing? Uh, were, did they start on land? Did they require plants before they existed? I'm a little bit. Uh, so, no. no. Uh, so f fungi, again, uh, there's not a real good fossil record of fungi in general, mm -hmm. which, which is a problem for lichens and a problem for the rest of the fungi as well. And so there's considerable uncertainty about the origin of fungi, but it's put out around a billion years ago. Okay, so they're very old. Very old. Um, predating terrestrial plants mm -hmm. and, and predating just about anything we would recognize today as familiar life. Right. Yeah. So there's like, there's several big groups of fungi that split off in the, in the mists of early time, uh, but two of the big groups led to the things that we see now in the supermarket as button mushrooms, mm -hmm. and these are called basidiomycetes. And there's a lot of different things in this group around the button mushrooms that include things like rust fungi and a okay. variety of different bizarre yeasts. And then there is like the all important yeast that gives us bread and beer and other things. And that arose within this other group that split off around a billion years ago called the cup fungi, the ascomycetes. And virtually all lichens are made of fungi from this big group called the ascomycetes. Okay. There's tens of thousands of species of ascomycetes and yeast, uh, uh, baker's yeast, which is also used for beer making, is just one of those mm -hmm. thousands of, of species. And one of those groups went off, well, multiple groups have gone off and made lichen associations, symbiotic associations. There are also wicked pathogens that have arisen that we take drugs against and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and fear in the form of outbreaks. <laughs> um, so all kinds of things have happened in, in that second half of the fungal kingdom. So uh, recently there was a story people talking about uh, how some lichens are not just algae and fungi, but there's a third member of the symbiosis. That's right. So for close to 140 years, people have characterized, generalized the lichen symbiosis as a partnership between an ascomycete fungus, so the second group of fungi, the cup mm -hmm. fungi, and any number of different photosynthesizing algae. Occasionally cyanobacteria can also get involved. There's a lot of different variations on the theme, but what was, what was pretty constant in this uh, uh, paradigm, this, this dogma mm -hmm. that's pretty well established is that there's always got to be just one fungus and that's going to be an ascomycete fungus. And yeah, that's kind of where our story enters uh, year 2016. We're grinding up a bunch of lichens at the University of Montana, collaboration with a couple other groups, and trying to figure out 
how specific chemical substances, toxic substances that are formed in this particular lichen here, actually both of these, um, how they are formed. And what we find, long story short, is at the end of the day, we have three genomes, not two. We're expecting an algal genome and a fungal genome mm -hmm. after going through all of these. And no matter how hard we try and how often we replicate these uh, experiments, we have three genomes. And so that gets us really scratching our head. Mm -hmm. And so are you still scratching your head or do you have answers? We have a couple answers now that have uh, moved us to the next level. And one of uh, sort of the central theme to, to the new discovery is that anywhere we have this toxic substance, we have tiny, tiny yeast cells that belong to this first group of fungi, the basidiomyces, mm -hmm. and they seem to be a constant presence in these lichens. And they've been overlooked for, uh, for 140 years, as, as I was saying. So any time- But microscopically, you're not gonna see this? Like in, micros under a microscope? Microscopically, they're really hard to see. Yeah. Super hard to see. So we had to develop special techniques of um, ribosome labeling to actually do it at a subcellular level to get these cells to glow, right. to light up, and tell us who they are based mm. on their DNA sequences. Hmm. So explain that to me because that sounds fascinating. Yeah, so basically when you take one of these lichens and you make a slice and put a tiny piece of it on a microscope slide, you just see a whole bunch of filaments that belong to fungus. And then mm -hmm. you see some green blobs mm -hmm. that look like alga mm -hmm. because they've got the chlorophyll in them. So they're, you know, you can kind of make that difference. It looks like two things. Uh, but when you've ground those up over and over again and you find that there are three genomes and two of them are fungal, it's really difficult to tell the difference between some of the filament mm -hmm. stuff that you see on the slide and what else could be on there. How would you know which is which? So what we did is we had the uh, DNA sequences behind the ribosomes, the machinery right. that goes and trans, uh, uh, translates um, messenger yeah. RNA into, uh, into proteins. Protein. Yeah. And what we did is we unfurled these uh, ribosomal sequences and we looked at what portions of these sequences are characteristic for the cup fungus and which portions mm -hmm. are characteristic for the uh, the, the basidiomycete fungus and mutually exclusive. And we developed little probes that have the reverse sequence so that they would attach to these sets of uh, DNA sequences and quote unquote hybridize with them. So mm -hmm. they would actually like dock and attach. And at the ends of these little probes are little fluorophores, little uh, additional molecules that have been added that light up when excited with a specific, uh, uh, particular wavelength. Mm -hmm. So, and now you can see that there is that thing in, and where, where like its filaments are in both of these fungus, both yes. of these yeah. lichen that are on this, this particular branch. Right. And right. so like, does that mean that it's probably much more common than we think it is? If they could be on one branch together and look quite different? Yeah. So a couple things surprised us. Uh, one was, uh, and we found this out fairly early in the study, is that each lichen appears to have its own quote unquote secondary fungus or mm. yeast. So this one has a separate one than this one. And these two have a separate one from, from the others on the table. And we so sort of expanded. Are you saying that all lichens have this third? That's, that's an interesting point. Uh, so going back to the point about early lichen evolution and how mm -hmm. these many groups broke off and then mm -hmm. I kind of compared them to, you know, sauropsids, uh, a group broke off around the same time as the dinosaur avian group broke off and then a group broke off about the same time that marsupials split from placentals and other things. Mm -hmm. The same goes for lichens. And there's one group of lichens that is more successful than all the others. And it arose around the same time as the early mammals. Mm -hmm. And that includes these. Okay. And we call them the parmelioid macro lichens. And within the parmelioid macro lichens, virtually all species that we've looked at have this additional fungus. And so we think that these parmelioid lichens may be somehow involved in a, another type of symbiosis with these yeasts uh, that may have made them, for all we know, we can't rule this out at this point, maybe you had a hand in making them very successful. Right. But we can't say the same for some of these other lichens that uh, these, these are kind of, this is kind of the dinosaur lichen. Um, <laughs> this is like the amphibian lichen. And this, this is another example of the parmelioid lichen. So the parmelioid macro lichens can be really different in form and, and, and shape and color. 
uh, but, but they belong to this really successful modern large group that's on every terrestrial uh, habitat on the mm -hmm. planet, basically in every continent. And then these things, they've got other things going on. This is, <laughs> this is research for another day. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. It's very cool. Um, that was big news, uh, so congrats on working on that yeah, project. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to try to remember the names of the different lichens. Parmelioid? Parmelioid, that was like really right close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, We're trying just... to popularize these, these obscure names. I mean, if people can say, you know, Archaeopteryx, then they can say Parmelioid. Because <laughs> you know little kids, they're going to get super obsessed with uh, this guy. It's just as just as exciting as a dinosaur. Exactly. This is just as exciting as a dinosaur. I mean, this is. I mean, it's basically is, like it's it is as old as a dinosaur. This in terms of uh, when it you know when it split off from its. Yeah, or root. older. Um, yeah, this this is a really interesting uh, lichen because it's so different from so many other lichens, and it it arose separately from from other lichens as well. So all of these things they have their particular means of attachment. This thing is called an umbilicate lichen because it's got something like an umbilicus or mm -hmm. belly button and it's attached by a single strong hold fast. This particular individual may be hundreds of years old. They're very, very slow growing and they just are attached to rocks like that. And you just yanked it right off a rock. Well, you? in the interests of science and education. Yeah. <laughs> and it changes color dramatically when you put it in water as well. So we're going to do that. Oh. And we're gonna watch it. Is it still alive then? It's still alive. It was it was alive and happy in its habitat as as late as yesterday evening. Oh, okay. And uh, and it's gonna do its thing. And a lot of these things you can you can kind of see. This is we'll just call these the amphibians for today's purposes. <laughs> they're they're as different uh, from these other groups of lichens as uh, as amphibians are from mammals. And they're gonna be happy now. Yeah. So so th we're gonna have the dry wet and. Uh, this, this will take uh, a minute or two, and it's going to change color dramatically. And the way it changes color is, lapse. is going to <laughs> tell you a little bit about what's on the inside of it. Because you're going to see the alga is waking up now, and it's becoming very, very happy. So we have the dry one here, and this one's going green, and this one is going another hue of gray towards green. It's no longer this kind of chalky white thing. Mm-hmm. So they're well, becoming turning very green. They're becoming physiologically active. They're registering the lights around us, and uh, that's one of the cool things about lichens. Is unlike a lot of other organisms, they can go from dormant to active within 60 to 90 seconds, mm. because they need to be able to capitalize on whatever little moisture or rain they get. This is why they can live in deserts on on cactus stumps. Mm. And yeah, and basically be completely dormant for. Yep. And they can take advantage of fog rolling in off the ocean without it ever needing to rain. Neat. Well, um, I cannot believe how green and lush that thing looks now. Yeah, look at oh, that. Wow. Dormant, yeah, active, active, and happy. So I uh, suppose now we should just we should just hang out with some kind of animal, because you know may maybe something that will try to eat some of these, maybe not. We can uh, we can see how it feels around lichen. We can see how it goes. We're back, Jesse. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm also well. Good. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really exciting. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, this is Toby. This is Jesse. It's nice to introduce you to each other. <laughs> good to see you. Um, did you bring something for I us? Did. Oh, I did. I did. You've never met her before. Okay. Her name is Jabba. After Jabba the Hutt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you imagine what she might look like? Like a, a hut, <laughs> like a like a like an adult hut. Yeah. Not yeah. a not a hutling. Yeah. So let me let me just let me just bring her out here. Oh, you she do is. look like a hut. Like a well, I guess he was sort of a toad man without <laughs> a, legs. A little bit, a little bit. I think I think her mouth most most closely resembles him. Yeah. Um, and what? we didn't know if it was male or female when we got her, and mm -hmm. then she grew up and, and she's a female. And how do you tell? Well, uh, so should I tell you what it is? Yes, sure. Do that first. <laughs> this is an African pixie frog, also known as an African bullfrog. And um, 
you can tell if they're a male or female as they mature. Their throat, the male's throat. Don't do not put your finger in front of her mouth. Okay. I'll tell you why in a second. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> um, she. Uh, so a as they grow, the the male's going to have a very yellow throat, and the female's going to have a cream-colored throat, and then the female's going to top out at about four, four and a half inches, and the male's going to get almost ten. Oh, so you did not inches. know what you were signing up for. We didn't know what we had. Ten-inch toad would not even fit in this case. And I'm glad you said toad because you're wrong. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, this looks so slimy. Why did I say toad? I, well, I know. <laughs> I, I mean, she has little bumps on her, um, yeah. but she's a frog. And um, there's a big difference between frogs, true frogs and true toads. Mm -hmm. And um, true frogs are going to have teeth on, oh. their, on their upper part of their mouth. And um, pixie frogs are are pretty intense. They actually have three huge teeth on the bottom as well, and they're known to be quite aggressive. Um, and if you can imagine a, a 10 inch <laughs> pixie frog in the yeah. wild, you walk up to and you're like, whoa, that's awesome. Hey, let's, you know, yeah. bug no, it. You know, around. no, no. Why, why does They'll someone bite want one of these? Um, was this a pet? I, it was a pet, and they just they didn't want her anymore. Um, and we're like that thing has pretty big teeth. Like, <laughs> maybe they got <laughs> maybe they got bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you, you don't want to mess around with that. I mean, it gets you good. Big, mm -hmm. big teeth. Um, the other difference between a, a frog and a toad is um, toads are going to have really big pits behind their eyes, and um, that's going to be poison glands back there. And so what? she she has what? a little Wait. bit of toxicity. Toads what? have been poisonous my whole life, and I didn't know that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever heard the story where it's like a dog's messing with one, and then you go, ah, you know, and they've been sprayed by poison? No. No? Okay. Well, sorry. Have you? No, I haven't oh. heard that either. That, I learned something new. That, I am upset that I didn't know that about <laughs> Well, toads. not very many, many of them are, are toxic enough to like kill a human. Well, certainly, but even a little bit of venom. Yeah, I it's not venom. Not, sorry, po poison. poison. Yeah, so they're not injecting, okay. they're not biting it into you or stinging it into you. It's just secreted by the, the poison you. glands, and then they can like shoot it out of their poison glands. So um, it comes out of a whole messes. separate system. And all toads can do this? Toad, all, one species, I think, yeah. 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 Huh. Yeah. Wow. And then frogs, they're, they're a little bit toxic on their skin, so they taste bad and, and they can mm -hmm. make you know, a small animal mm -hmm. sick that wants to eat it. But um, yeah, yeah. But, but toads are, are definitely more poisonous. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So she, she's not really poisonous. These guys are actually eaten as a delicacy in Africa. Mm. Um, she yeah. moved when she you said like, that. Oh, yeah. no. I did not like to hear oh, about no. that. No. But you just got to take the skin off first. Uh, I, 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 I didn't research into it that much. Well, I'm guessing, you, you know. I didn't see how they prepared him. Well, yeah, I just feel like if, uh, if I'm going to prevent an animal from eating me. Get oh, in there, get in there. Yeah, that feels you good. You are something else. <laughs> if She's I, going in her little sauna. <laughs> yeah, if I'm going to prevent an animal from eating me, putting my poison on my skin is probably the place to put it because it's the first yeah. the place that the animal's mouth encounters. Mm -hmm. But uh, most foxes, for example, aren't like skinning a frog before they eat it. No, and that's and that's why they can get sick from it. Yeah. Exactly, and they'll just taste bad. Too, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So she she's going to be moving around about fifty percent in the water and fifty percent on land. So I mean, I just gotta ask, what's the point of all of the frog? part of it like so I like I'm like okay so it needs eyes it needs a mouth uh -huh. it needs a head and uh -huh. legs uh -huh. what is all this extra stuff for because <laughs> well, like 90 percent of this frog is just like <laughs> out do you feed it too much this is what it's supposed to look like this is what she's supposed to look okay. like I don't I, I, I feel, feel like you're being a I do little feel really judgmental <laughs> I just want to I mean, know what it's for <laughs> I don't... She, so a male is going to be like half head. So like a male is going to have a head like this big. And it can eat and, and then the body is going to be like that. Oh my so God. it's huge. So anything that can fit in their mouth, they'll eat. Um, they're, they're carnivores. And so they'll eat birds and, and lizards and snakes and other frogs and, and small rodents. And um, I know, there's lots bonk. going on. Huh. <laughs> she just heard you recite the menu. I, I yeah. Just, ooh, delicious. <laughs> so... When they get threatened by a predator, say like a monitor lizard or something walks up and, and is going to try and eat her or a turtle or something, then she's going to puff up mm -hmm. as, as much as she can, so she's going to increase in, in size. She's mm. going to look quite a bit bigger, and uh, then she's going to do a little bit of a hiss, you know, um, mm -hmm. to try and scare them off. So the, the big body is going to help protect her. And these guys are actually the largest species of frog in Africa. They're the second largest in the world. 
the males are. I'm glad you don't huge. have a male on this. I mean, maybe yeah. I do. Maybe it's kind of cool. See it. They're yeah. huge. I got I got to hold one once, and it was just like I don't I don't have enough hand to hold you. It's weird to think of a frog that you are like physically afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> like most and, of the time, yeah. I see a frog, and I'm like, hey, buddy. <laughs> But if there's one that's like, it could fit my hand in its mouth. And, and it would hurt a lot. And it has big teeth. A lot, a yeah. lot. But you want to hear some, some like redeeming factors? Sure. Of, of the dad. The dads are actually really cool. Um, so the female's going to lay the eggs in um, a little pond. And they're going to live in like a, um, grasslands in Africa, like a central, south central. Mm -hmm. They have a very wide range um, down in, in south and central Africa. And... Um, in the grasslands, there's like these pools, and they're gonna be hanging out like around elephants and uh, just hanging out in those little ponds and, and puddles. And uh, so the dad has to watch the eggs, and um, after two days, they hatch. And then about three weeks later, the little tadpoles become little frogs and they can leave. But during this time, he has to make sure that they don't all die. There's actually a pretty high mortality rate. Um, about 20% sure. of them survive, and they're gonna be eating. That seems things. quite good to me. Considering they do... lay. Th Three to four thousand eggs at oh, a time. Yeah. Well, you only have to have like three of them survive. So, <laughs> so I, I mean, I like using that analogy because with, with kids because um, they will actually, if there's not enough food around, they'll actually eat each other. Sure. And then the dad, if he's like running out of energy to to keep them all alive, he'll just like snack on a couple and then, then a, <laughs> at least a couple like, survive, right? Yeah, Let, let's like, eat all of you. And then. Like, so like, You're gonna mention some redeeming qualities here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me oh. redeem them. And then he's like, he's like do jumping dad, jacks. The one who stops first, I eat. <laughs> His little legs, can you imagine? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is the cool thing. If the puddle starts drying out, then he, they have really strong back legs and they'll just push their head down and they will plow through the dirt and make these little tunnels to bigger puddles. And so those little tadpoles can like mm. swim down into a big, that's bigger really puddle. Cool. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and they'll just eat, you, eat anything you, that tries to attack them. You build a canal. Yeah. You're a canal builder. She doesn't, she, she, she well, leaves. your species. <laughs> the dad does. Also, even if you had it, he wouldn't build canals. He'd be stuck in a box. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you don't want a male. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's about wanting. It's You'd just take like one. It, yeah, if if one needed a home, we we would yeah, take one in. Okay. Yeah. So so we're happy to care for whatever we get. But you don't do a lot of handling. <laughs> I don't, and and the reason is because she's an amphibian. Um, right. She can soak up some toxins from us, oils and stuff like right. that, and also. She doesn't really like it that yeah. much. Um, so these guys, th there's another really cool thing they do. So Africa has a big dry season. And um, they will burrow down into the ground, and then they will coat themselves in a, a cocoon of dead cells. And um, it, it retains the moisture inside. And they can actually, they'll lose like half of the amount of moisture when they're in this cocoon thing. They can ride out a dry season. And uh, they can actually use the, <laughs> the liquid from their bladder to keep themselves moist. Um, so if you ever pick up a, a frog of, of any sort and they pee on you, that's a defense mechanism. But it's also pretty dangerous for them to expel all of their fluids, mm -hmm. um, especially if, the, if, if dry season is coming up. Um, so I, I, I don't like to stress her out that sure, much. Yeah. I, I want her nice and liquidy. Well puffed up. You seem to have got plenty of liquid right now. Oh, and when, they, and when the, the wet season comes, it like moistens up that cocoon and it like cracks open and then they eat it. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> nice. Oh, weird. <laughs> that is that weird. That's awesome. Yeah, You're that's weird. Take, takes enjoyment to a whole new level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to mess with a frog like that. Mm, no, absolutely they, not. If they, and they start hissing at you. And yeah. Hissing as well. With big yeah, teeth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Baring their teeth. Their like, teeth. Yeah. Well, they look so pretty funny because they have like, these big, funny, ridiculous teeth underneath. But, but I mean. Funny, ridiculous until they're inside until, your hands. Until, you, until yeah. you put your hand in there. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jabba, thank you for visiting. Yeah. And thank you for visiting, Jesse. Thanks uh, for having me. You can see more of what Jesse's up to at youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. Toby, thank you for sharing all of your beautiful lichen yeah. and, and how amazingly active they are. I didn't expect to be so excited about this. Uh, so thanks a lot and, and yeah, keep thanks doing for cool me. research. And thank you, people of the internet, for watching this episode of the SciShow Talk Show. If you want to keep getting smarter with us, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe. And when a planet crosses in front of a star, then it, it blocks out a tiny bit of light. And you can see this in, in this data. And this is what the Planet Hunter researchers of citizen scientists...